This is a prophet martyr story in the tradition of the prophet martyrs of Israel. You might want to look up the martyrdom and ascension of Isaiah, which is an earlier prophet martyr story. In that story, Isaiah is accused of prophesying against Jerusalem and against the temple by his enemies, and he is tried before the king and is found guilty, and he is sawn in two with a wood saw. The story of uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was nearly killed, uh, was thrown into a cistern, was only rescued at the last moment. Elijah was involved in a life and death struggle with Jezebel, the wife of Ahab. Jezebel is in the background of this story, in the memories of Jezebel and of that conflict between Elijah and Jezebel lie in the background of this story of John the Baptist. Elijah was constantly telling Ahab how corrupt he was, and by implication, because Jezebel was bringing in all the prophets of Baal, that he was violating the will of God implicitly by having married Jezebel. So Elijah's confrontation with the priests of Baal, in which he first defeated and then killed 400 of the priests of Baal. He then escapes because he knows that Jezebel is going to try to kill him. And the only reason that Elijah survives this battle with Jezebel is that she got killed before he did. But he fled in fear of his life. Well, John was clearly in dialogue with the king, Herod. And incidentally, this is not Herod who built the temple. It is his son, uh, Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod the Great, who succeeded his father then in the division of the kingdom. He was one of the three sons of Herod who became his successor, and he ruled in the area of Galilee. And so clearly the story implies that John the Baptist was instead a dialogue with the king, as is typical of the prophets. That is, that the prophets are always, in one way or another, speaking to those who are in power and, in various ways, confronting them, guiding them, in some instances, helping them, in others, opposing them if they do that which is wrong. Well, in this instance, John, in his conversation with Herod, said, you know, it's not right. It's against the law for you to have your brother's uh, wife, because he had fallen in love. And Philip, who was another one of the successors of Herod, Herod Antipas had uh, uh, married her. She had fallen in love with him, had left her husband and married Herod. He had a bigger kingdom. She was a pretty, how shall we say, she looked out for her own interests. So she was determined to get John the Baptist because he was steadily criticizing their marriage in public, and it made it very uncomfortable for them. So the story of the banquet is a story of ancient banquets. The story of Esther and the uh, banquet that was held when Vashti refused to come in to the banquet, probably naked, and uh, to be shown to the king's guests. The story of the banquet in Daniel, when the words appeared on the wall. These great banquets of kings are also in the background. So it, this, this needs to be told with that kind of spirit of these great uh, royal banquets. And the one who comes in to dance is then Herod Antipas' stepdaughter. It's Herodias's daughter, Herodias, who then comes in and dances. We don't know how old she was, probably 12, 13, 14. There are clearly... In the background of the story, the implication that uh, Herod was, uh, on the one hand, delighted at this uh, dance of, uh, of his stepdaughter. On the other hand, there is the clear implication that, uh, that he had been turned on. So there are various implications of this, and it's, uh, it's fun, and it's thoroughly appropriate to play with that in the telling of the story. It is not necessarily implied that this was the dance of the seven veils in which she, you know, did a striptease or something as as has been part of the development of the legend of this story. It was probably a more innocent dance than uh, than that. And 
And also, it was the dance of a, of a girl, not of a voluptuous woman. She has often been portrayed in operas and so on. This story reflects the actual politics of the period, and there is there are other signs in the historical record that this marriage actually did happen. Herod Antipas was the king. Uh, he did marry Herodias, or the wife of his uh, brother, Philip, and that was part of the corruption that was recognized. The impact of the execution is a horror for the storyteller, for the listeners. This is a sign of political corruption at its very worst. Herod Antipas, knowing who John was, knowing that he was a prophet, executes him at the whim of his wife's request. The contrast between the innocence of the girl asking for the head of John the Baptist on a platter and Herod's motives is grotesque. Herod demands and orders that he be executed because he had vowed to the girl that he would give her whatever he wanted. He never was required by any law to execute an innocent man in order to fulfill his vow. It is a sign of the utter corruption and evil of the authorities, of those in power, of Herod. This story also has many common elements with the story of the trial before Pilate. Pilate also condemns Jesus to death, knowing that he had done nothing wrong. This execution is ordered also out of political expediency and out of a desire to save his own reputation and his own political future. In the same way, Herod here clearly has John executed rather than suffer the embarrassment of not fulfilling his vow. When you tell this story, you need to convey in some way the grotesque character of this trial and of this whimsical execution. It is a tragedy of a great prophet who becomes a martyr at the hands of a capricious ruler.